Good morning. Happy Easter. It's good to see you all. Our theme for this Easter is the lion and the lamb. I'm going to start first with the lamb. There's so many different titles for Jesus, but I think the lamb was John, the disciple's favorite topic, because in the last book of the Bible, Revelation, he calls Jesus the lamb 31 times. Why is that? Well, it's a motif of the lamb that was slain down through all of scripture, all of salvation history. You see, the first two chapters of the Bible describe a perfect world that God created. The last two chapters of the Bible describe a perfect world that God will recreate, that he will restore someday, still future. And in between is the story of humanity and the awesome, amazing plan of salvation that God has implemented for us. Very beginning, Adam and Eve sin, and suddenly they feel shame. They feel nakedness. They run and hide, and God makes clothes for them from an animal skin, perhaps a sheep. And then in the next chapter, their first kids, Cain and Abel, have conflict, and they both bring offerings to offer God, but, but God only acknowledges or accepts Abel, the younger brother's offering. Why? Because Cain brings produce from farming, and Abel brings what God had apparently asked them to bring, a lamb, a unblemished little lamb, sacrificed. You see, Cain's offering was a bloodless offering, and it was not acceptable. We keep reading, and, and very soon we see in Genesis chapter 22, a, an amazing story where God tested Abraham, and he said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, and offer him on Mount Moriah. Abraham must have been very confused by that command, didn't understand it, but he chose to obey anyway. And it says in Genesis 22, 6, Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went <clears throat> on together, Isaac spoke up and said to the fa his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Isaac's question was a good one. It was, perspective, it was perceptive. And in some ways, that question continues throughout the entire Old Testament, echoing down through history. Where is the lamb? Where is the lamb? What is all this pointing forward to? <clears throat> Abraham, when his son asked that question, responded with what became prophetic insight when he said, God will provide himself a lamb for the sacrifice. And on the top of Mount Carmel, which later became known as Mount Calvary, God stopped Abraham from sacrificing his son. And he looked over and he saw a ram caught in the thicket by its horns, sort of like a lamb wearing a crown of thorns. And the, the text says that ram was offered instead of, key words, instead of or in place of Isaac, a foretelling of redemption to come. When God led the Israelites out of Egypt, out of their slavery and bondage, each family was ordered to sacrifice a firstborn lamb, a substitute, and sprinkle the blood over the doorposts of their houses. This was to give them protection from the final plague. And it would pass over if there was blood on the doorposts. And so it became known as the Passover and became an annual commemoration of redemption. In the wilderness, the people of God were instructed to build first a tent, a tabernacle, and then later a permanent temple in Jerusalem. And there were lamb sacrifices every day at nine in the morning and three in the afternoon. And through the prophets, there were some hints about what all this was pointing to. For example, Isaiah 53, the whole chapter, an amazing prophecy in detail of the coming Messiah. We read this in verse 7. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. But for the most part, these lamb sacrifices contained mystery. Imagine a little child going with his parents to the temple, and he's got his little lamb there. It's a year old. It has a name. It has a personality. And the child is heartbroken to think about this lamb dying. 
He watches his father as he puts his hands on the head of the lamb and confesses his sins and the sins of his family and uh, then hands that lamb over to the priest for the sacrifice. And the child says, Daddy, why must our little lamb die? And the father breathes a silent prayer and he turns toward heaven and he says, yes, God, why? Why? Where is the lamb? This wasn't a pleasant, th a pleasant thing. It was messy. It was ugly. It was bloody. And that was the point. The law said that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sin. Blood represents life. The problem with these sacrifices is they, they were never enough. There was always more required. They were temporary. They were insufficient. They were pointing ahead to something else. People continued to wonder, and implicitly they asked, where is the lamb? Where is the lamb? And they waited, and they wondered, not fully clear why God required this ritual or how or when it would end. And so that question that Isaac raised to his father continued to echo down through the ages, where is the lamb? Where is the lamb? Until, until that day when John the Baptist was preaching, and he spotted in the crowd and he pointed with his finger and he said, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus entered into Jerusalem last Sunday. We call it Palm Sunday, but the Jews called it Lamb Selection Day. You see, five days before the lambs were sacrificed on Passover, according to the law, there, there was Lamb Selection Day. And so the people waving the palm branches and shouting Hosanna to the son of David as Jesus rode that donkey, they were hoping for a national king, but unknowingly, they were actually performing the ultimate and final lamb selection. In fact, the lambs for slaughter were owned by religious leaders and they were kept outside the city to the, uh, just over the hill in Bethlehem. And the flocks were driven down the same road that Jesus took as he rode the donkey into Jerusalem. Maybe, we don't know, but maybe they were intermingled along the way as a grand fulfillment of all the prophecies and shadows as, as Jesus himself, the Lamb, capital L, the Passover Lamb, rides into Jerusalem. The lambs had to be inspected before they could be uh, offered and they had to be spotless. And so Jesus was inspected, if you will, during his trial. They could find no fault in him. Even the made-up charges would not stick, for he was spotless. On Passover Friday, the same day the Passover lamb, lambs were to be slain in remembrance of, of freedom from bondage, the ultimate true Passover lamb was sacrificed, signifying ultimate freedom from spiritual bondage. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. He's the fulfillment. He died once for all on the cross. He, his, he was the perfect divine substitute. He became sin for us. He absorbed our sin into himself, and he, he drank the very last drop of the cup of God's holy wrath towards sin. And when he finished it, he turned it over and he cried, it is finished. Yes. Amen? Amen? And you know what happened that very moment? In the temple, that huge veil that separated the holy place from the most holy place, three inches thick, was ripped from top to bottom by an unseen hand. And, and, and it was at the exact moment of the afternoon sacrifice, 3 p.m. Jesus was crucified at 9 a.m., the time of the morning sacrifice, and he died at 3 p.m. at the time of the afternoon sacrifice. I like to imagine the priests looking to see, looking into the most holy place where no one was to look or go except for the high priest once a year on the Day of Atonement. And so they look with terror and fear and forget about the lamb. And the lamb wiggles and, and gets loose and jumps off and runs away because the ultimate lamb has paid the price. When Jesus said, it is finished, it was. Sin was dealt with forever. Forgiveness and salvation was purchased for all who will receive that gift of grace. And I hope that all of you have. And if not, I hope you will, even today. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for this beautiful truth that we celebrate. Thank you for the cross. Thank you, Jesus, for being the lamb who was slain for our sins. 
<clears throat> and I, those of us who, who have received that gift are filled with joy and ready to praise and worship today. And for any who have not yet said yes to Jesus, I pray that today will be the day. And maybe even today, there will be some who are baptized who didn't know they were going to be baptized, just as they were in the first service, as they go public with their faith. We give you praise, we give you honor, and we worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. They took down Jesus' lifeless body and placed it in a nearby tomb. But he did not stay there for long. There was a mighty roar, and the, the heavy stone was blown away, and Jesus came out. He is risen. Amen? Yeah. He is risen. He is risen. Indeed, he is risen. And he has defeated Satan and sin, and he has conquered over all that's against you and that would, would prevent you from experiencing the blessings that he has for you. And also through his resurrection, Jesus was confirmed as to who he said he was. And, and it was demonstrated that God had accepted his, his sacrifice on behalf of humanity. Jesus forever conquered sin, Satan, and death. The lamb that was slain is the lion who now reigns. He's strong. He's wild. He's a defender, a protector, an avenger. He entered the world the first time as a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes. He will enter the world dramatically in the future the second time as a mighty conqueror dressed for war to vindicate his children. The lamb that was slain is the lion that now reigns. In the last book of the Bible, in Revelation chapter 1, we read about how John, one of Jesus' disciples, was banished for his faith to an island out in the Mediterranean Sea called Patmos. And while he was there, in chapter 1, we read, he encountered the resurrected Jesus, who had a message that he wanted to be written down and delivered to the churches. And Jesus was glorious. In fact, his face, it says there in Revelation 1, his, his, it says his face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. And as a result, John was just uh, overwhelmed and, and, and felt unworthy to be in his presence. In fact, it says... Uh, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me. Notice he's, he's mighty, but he's tender. And he said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I'm alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Yeah. In chapter 5, John is invited in vision up into the throne room of God. It's really impressive. In verse 1, he sees in vision the God sitting on his throne. And, and he's holding a scroll, which represents something important. Human redemption, the book of life, perhaps, the future of God's sovereign plan. But there's a problem. The scroll is shut up with seven seals. And unless someone is worthy to break those seals and, and un roll the scroll, all will be lost for the sons of Adam and the daughters of Eve. So a mighty angel asked in Revelation 5, 2, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. John says, I wept and wept because no one was found worthy. No one, no living Man or woman or angel of God or departed saint was worthy to redeem the human race. John sees this in his vision and he weeps and he weeps because no one is worthy. And if no one is worthy to open the scroll, then all hope seems gone. He sees only darkness and cold, perpetual winter of the soul, ending in despair and death. Always winter, never Christmas. But then comes the good news. Verse 5, then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. There are 24 titles for Jesus in the first five chapters of Revelation. And here's two of them, lion and the root of David. Those are actually titles out of the Old Testament that were prophecies of the coming Messiah, Savior, He's called the Lion of Judah in Genesis 49, verse 9. 
He's called the root of David in Isaiah 11, verse 1. For he would be a descendant of David and born in the city of David and from the tribe of Judah. Notice also that this lion, it said, is able. He's able to open the scroll. He's able to provide salvation. Why? Because the verse says he has triumphed. And, and the Greek word there is in the aorist verb, which means it's, it's completed past tense, indicating historical finished action. It's talking about what we're celebrating this weekend, the cross and the empty tomb. The lion has triumphed. His saving work is, is finished, and it is, it is sufficient. It is, he is victorious. Now, watch what happens next. John hears this good news that there's a powerful lion that has triumphed. And then in his vision, he turns to look. And what does he see? Verse 6, then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center before the throne. It had been slain, but now standing. In other words, his love is both self-sacrificing and victorious. This lion, lamb, is filled with infinite love. And suddenly, all heaven breaks forth in a triumph and, and, and in a praise service. As they say, verse 9, you are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased for God members of every tribe and language and people and nation. By virtue of his atoning sacrifice, he is able to save. Because he was slain, he broke the curse of sin by his blood, and he purchased those who had been held captive by the evil one. The lamb who was once slain is the lion who now reigns. If you ever have read or watched that uh, classic fantasy story called The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe from the Chronicles of Narnia, and I highly recommend it if you haven't, you know that C.S. Lewis created a fantasy world centered in the character and saving work of Aslan the Lion. The word Aslan, by the way, means lion in the Persian language. And Aslan is the hero and the only hope for Narnia. Aslan is, is clearly patterned after Jesus, the Lion of Judah. <clears throat> There's a problem in the land of Narnia. It's always winter. Years ago, there were various seasons, but now there's an evil witch who illegitimately claimed the land as her own and declared herself the queen and rules over it with an iron fist. She's kept it under her spell, making it winter all the time. With her magic power, she just dominates everyone in Narnia, and anyone who dares to oppose her is turned to stone and then displayed in her courtyard, the courtyard of her palace, as a demonstration of frozen testimony of her power. But there's a rumor circulating around Narnia, a rumor of hope. Aslan is on the move. And the mere mention of the name Aslan, the great lion, the, the true king of Narnia, the mere mention causes joy to well up in the hearts of many. But at the same time, it invokes fear in the hearts of those who are loyal to the witch. Aslan is on the move. Four children exploring a British mansion mysteriously enter a land, the land of Narnia through a, a, a wardrobe. And, and there's two daughters of Eve, two sons of Adam, one who becomes a traitor. How many of you know this story? Good. You all need to raise your hands. This is a good one. When Aslan's when Aslan's name is first heard by the children, they don't know who he is or, or what he is. And so Lucy asks, is, is he a man? And the beaver sternly says, Aslan, a man? Certainly not. Don't you know? He's the king of the beasts. Aslan is a lion, the lion, the great lion. Then is he safe? Asked Lucy. Safe? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. Mr. Beaver offers one final caution. Aslan is not a tame lamb. Lion, rather. Aslan is not a tame lion. The lion is not tame, not predictable, not caged, not even safe. 
but he's good. The lamb that was slain is the lion who now reigns. When, La, uh, when, when Aslan, the good king, the true king, returns to his rightful homeland, things start to change immediately. Snow starts to melt. There's evidence of new life everywhere. Aslan is on the move. When the witch insists that she has the right to take the life of the young boy Edmund because he's a traitor, he's come over to her side, Aslan calls the so-called queen aside and explains to her about a deeper magic, about a decree that allows an innocent one to be sacrificed in place of the guilty one. Aslan willingly offers his life in the place of that traitor. Aslan takes his place on the stone platform where the witch, thinking she has won, takes delight in plunging her knife into Aslan's heart. But as soon as she does, something happens. There's a deeper magic, which the witch never expected. When Aslan is killed, he, the, the curse of, 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 of evil dies with him, and death itself begins to work backwards. Finally, in the story, the resurrected Aslan bounds to her palace, and one by one, he goes to each statue and breathes on them the breath of life, and they are restored to new life. All who had once been turned to stone, the resurrected lion is on the move. Now, that's a fairy tale with a powerful metaphor for the real and true lion of Judah, Jesus Christ. When Jesus died and rose again, he broke the curse of sin. He broke the stranglehold of Satan and, and set free inhabitants of earth. And death itself began to work backwards. And now Jesus moves from person to person who is willing, breathing on them, restoring them to brand new life. Have you experienced that new life? I hope you have. I hope all of you have. If not, I hope that you will receive it even today. Has he breathed on you and turned your cold, stone, statue-like heart into a new heart of flesh? That's what happens when the lion is on the move. The lamb that was slain is now the lion who reigns. Amen? Amen. Today, we've been planning baptisms in all five of our services. We had four planned in the first and two spontaneous, so we have at, we're at six baptisms right now. I believe there are some who have planned to be baptized in this service. If so, during this next song, I'd like to invite you to meet me right back there in that corner, the prayer corner. But first, watch this. Saslan. What have they done? knew the true meaning of sacrifice, she might have interpreted the deep magic differently. That when a willing victim who has committed no treachery is killed in a traitor's stead, the stone table will crack, and even death itself would turn backwards. We sent the news that you were dead. Peter and Edmund will have gone to war. We have to help them. We will, dear one, but not alone. Climb on my back. We have far to go, and little time to get there. And you may want to cover your ears. 